Um, hello and good evening everyone. Uh, I'm sorry for the delay. Uh, actually there was some technical glitch. I was not able to connect my OBS with uh, YouTube. Uh, however, now I'm going to start with uh, the first chapter that is uh, the second chapter in respiratory diseases that is respiratory function disturbances. And uh, this chapter is basically the relationship between, uh, it provides a relationship between uh, physiology and connects it to pathology. Uh, the basic things that we are going to discuss will be related to lung structure and uh, function. and. Uh, uh, how that correlates with pathology, how we, uh, we can use various investigations to uh, uh, check out the various disorders that occur uh, in the respiratory system. So uh, the basic uh, the basic organization of this chapter is that first uh, you should know how the pulmonary structure is arranged. So in general, in when we talk about the, lung, uh, the pulmonary structure, the respiration system, then it basically comprises of airways. Uh, along with uh, that are encased in the lungs along with that we have the chest wall that is present out outside including the diaphragm and all of this structure is innervated by a neuromuscular system and between uh, the lungs and the chest wall we are having the presence of the pleural cavity which is lined by the which is lined by a thin layer of pleural fluid so this is the basic structure of the lung the entire pulmonary system a schematic diagram uh, that will uh, once again show all these contents is uh, represented over here first is that this is the chest wall over here we have the lung parenchyma the zone that is present in between this zone is uh, that for the pleural cavity and inside this structure we are having the presence of the airway this airway itself is lined by a very thin layer of pleural fluid this layer it is itself lined by a very uh, thin layer of pleural fluid that acts to reduce surface tension. The basic function of respiration, the basic function of respiration is uh, to provide oxygen and to eliminate carbon dioxide. So uh, this particular function is achieved via two step process. Uh, first in step number one, uh, air is inhaled and thus alveoli receives the oxygen. So whatever air we breathe, it comes to the oxygen, it becomes a part of alveoli and this we call as uh, alveolar uh, partial pressure of oxygen. This then has to diffuse via the respiratory membrane that is present over here and enter inside the bloodstream. And finally, the third component is related to the blood vessel itself. So uh, whatever the ventilation V occurs inside the alveoli, it has to be matched to that of the perfusion and with this matching we will uh, be able to have uh, appropriate arterial oxygen concentration in the bloodstream this is the basic theory of uh, uh, how the lung mechanics work this is all represented in the form of a flow chart that is present above so here we are having first an alveolar ventilation and the third second one we have gas exchange the gas exchange itself comprises as a set of two major components one is diffusion the other one is the appropriate perfusion the, okay so this is referred to as vq matching this particular thing is referred to as vq matching So in the first uh, category we are having the alveolar ventilation. This alveolar ventilation itself uh, occurs by two main processes. First is that you have to change the thoracic cavity volume and the second that you have to provide air flow inside the cavity. So this changing of the thoracic cavity volume it is, uh, it is mediated by the neuromuscular system. This neuromuscular system is going to change the thoracic cavity dimensions in the antero posterior dimensions in the superior inferior dimensions as also in the lateral dimensions. So this is how the thoracic cavity volume is increased and uh, this static function uh, of, or the, uh, the static function of the lung is itself uh, comprising of three major components. First is neuromuscular system that acts via chest wall, that acts via chest wall to increase the thoracic cavity volume and this is coupled with the lungs and the airway and this acts together as one unit and uh, with that one unit together the lung is inflated or deflated. Uh, in normal resting conditions, 
this um, lung parenchyma it is basically having the tendency for recoil it is having the tendency to recoil and the airway because of the lined alveolar fluid uh, there is surface tension t that is existing on this this is given by the formula t is equals to 2 p uh, pr by 2 w this is given by pr by 2 w whereas um, the chest wall itself is having its own elastic recoil properties and this tends all of this tends to collapse the airway all of this tends to collapse the airway and this airway has to be closed but the chest wall on the other hand it tends to recoil outside it tends to recoil outward whereas as i said the lung the entire structure lungs and airway tends to collapse inward because of these two opposing forces we will see that uh, this intra pleural this pleural cavity is having a negative pleural pressure so this is the intra pleural pressure which is negative the value is somewhere around minus 5 cm of water now uh, the coupling of this um, chest movement and the airway movement is such that uh, the transpulmonary pressure which is defined by tpp which is equals to p alpha o2 minus the intrapleural pressure will guide uh, to whether inflation or deflation will be happening in the lung so if i say that uh, you are inspiring the chest wall cavity will increase now if the neuromuscular system has received the in a signal for inspiration and the inspiration is occurring so chest wall tries to move out and we know that in this closed cavity system we are first having we are first experiencing that uh, the uh, volume pv is equals to constant so we will have this volume that is going to uh, that, that, that is going to increase so pressure will likely fall so because of that fall in pressure the p alveolar o2 it actually uh, decreases to less than p atmospheric pressure because it falls to less than p atmospheric pressure we will see that it is uh, going to cause the air to move from the atmosphere into the lungs this is the mechanism for inspiration similarly expiration happens where uh, the chest wa uh, chest wall dimensions will close and that will cause the alveolar pressure to increase above that of the atmospheric pressure and that will cause exhalation of the air to occur uh, because this transpulmonary pressure will become positive this all is represented with the help of a compliance diagram and uh, that compliance diagram is uh, basically represented with the help of trans respiratory pressure trans respiratory pressure which is the pressure between the atmosphere minus the pressure that is present in the alveoli now uh, if this value uh, if this value plo2 is equal to 0 if i represent volume over here and the difference of that is the trp over here then uh, the particular volume at which this value is 0 is referred to as frc of the lung is referred to as frc of the lung so after that if this p alveolar o2 it starts decreasing if it starts decreasing because the chest wall dimension has moved out because the chest wall cavity has moved out p atmosphere will move inside that is the air outside the lung it will try to move inside and that will cause uh, the chest wall dimensions to increase uh, that will lead to inspiration and thus the chest wall cavity uh, the air then the lung volumes will start increasing so this is how it is represented so it will gradually under maximal inhalation it will achieve the volume of tlc similarly uh, during expiration this can be extrapolated uh, and the volume that is achieved under uh, the uh, under the normal conditions the patient is able to achieve residual volume so the patient can never achieve a um, uh, volume of uh, zero he will always uh, end at the level of residual volume the reason for this is uh, referred to as dynamic airway collapse so when expiration happens when expiration occurs then uh, during that process because the smaller airways they do not have any supporting uh, supporting structure that is going to support them for uh, during expiration and so the the elastic recoil pressures will overpower the pressures that are present inside the uh, uh, tubular system and that will cause uh, the decomp uh, that will immediately cause uh, this uh, tubes to collapse and some amount of air will be trapped within the alveoli and that is referred to as res residual volume of the air these uh, total lung capacities and residual volumes they cannot be measured directly so you need uh, some measurement methods to uh, identify these lung volumes these methods include first body plethysmography and second is helium or neon dilution method 
of the two the better one is uh, body plethysmography actually it is capable of uh, even uh, providing us even more uh, information regarding the respiratory function and uh, it will provide important information regarding the airway resistance to us along with that it can provide an index of neuromuscular function so uh, in this structure we have completed the st uh, what are the various structures and what contribute to the static function now uh, looking at how this will work in a mechanical perspective uh, we should take note that these lungs and all these airways they contribute to the elastic recoil forces of the lung which includes the lung recoil that is uh, mediated by the elastic structures which are present in the lung tissue and the surface tension that uh, is mediated by the uh, the surfactant fluid that is present inside the uh, that is uh, present at the air fluid the air liquid interface that is present at the level of alveoli now the chest wall recoil and the uh, Uh, lung and airway as i already described because they are opposing forces the intrapleural pressure will become negative similarly the transpleural pressure or the distending pressure will uh, is defined as the p alveolar minus uh, ipp and it will be the guide to whether inspiration or expiration is occurring all these processes uh, are ref will contribute to static work of breathing and the static work of breathing is nothing but the minute ventilation it will be the guide to minute ventilation so minute ventilation is defined as uh, uh the tidal volume minus the dead space aspiration uh times the respiratory rate so if the respiratory rate increases work of breathing will increase if the tidal volume of the body uh, if due to some particular need or uh, due to excessive effort is is increased then in that condition the work of breathing will increase the uh, and now uh, similarly we are having the air the now i discussed that there were two components first component was the change in the thoracic cavity volume the other was the airway uh, and the, the, the second component of the pulmonary system was to alter the air flow that is provide the dynamic uh, the, uh, provide the dynamic uh, stream of air flow inside the alveoli now this is done uh, this has two major components that affect the work of breathing okay this is referred to as a dynamic component first is a frictional airway resistance that is mediated by the movement of molecules uh, into that uh, into the stream of the flow and this is generally very minimal both during inspiration as exp expiration the value is less than 2 cm of water per liter per second uh, but the dynamic airway resistance is more important it generally occurs during rapid exhalation process and it is itself explained by the bernoulli principle uh, the bernoulli principle is studied in physics in which we state that if there is a fluid a constant stream of fluid that uh, undergoes through a variation in its height and its velocity and uh, the cross section of the area in which it is flowing then uh, the delta p that is a changes in the pressure the changes in the kinetic energy and the change in potential energy that will happen uh, in this stream of uh, fluid will remain completely uh, constant so they will be equals to zero so if suppose i am talking about the airway if suppose uh, we consider this airway this is the larger airway this is the smaller airway and this is then the alveoli uh, we know that delta p is equals to q into r and q is equals to a into v so in the smaller uh, in the smaller sections of the airways we know that the total cross sectional area of the alveoli or the of the smaller di smaller dimension airways they are more so we know that that because the total cross sectional area is more the velocity will eventually be less if the velocity is less then the kinetic energy is less so if the energy uh, has these components then if kinetic energy component is more then the pressure component will be more but uh, when the uh, velocity say for example during exhalation uh, the uh, the entire air stream has to move from a large cross sectional area and come into an area of uh, a of very small uh, cross sectional area compared to that which was offered by the alveoli so this requires that the velocity to increase so this velocity increase is because of the bernoulli principle because energy and pressure this relationship remains the same if the kinetic energy will increase then it means that the pressure has to fall so if the pressure inside the airway decreases the elastic recoil forces will again overpower and that will cause the airway collapse to occur during the expiration process so uh, this is referred to as the dynamic airway resistance and it is very classically seen in the case of emphysema but it can also be seen in asthma or chronic bronchitis any condition that causes airway narrowing and also something that leads to increase uh, airway collapsibility like tracheomalacia and uh, this phenomena itself is referred to as autopeep phenomena and this is a ventilator setting in which uh, 
what happens is uh, that due, due to this uh, dynamic airflow limitation there is some restriction on the compliance of the lung that is imposed uh, the reason for that is because some amount of air some amount of air from the lungs cannot escape uh, uh, because of the closure of these airways there is a flow limitation that will occur uh, the patient will not be able to completely expire uh, the air that he had inhaled because the process will be prolonged and now on supposed of it the blood oxygen concentration will start falling down and that will immediately drive the respiratory centers to start inspiration so inspiration is started before the complete exhalation occurs and thus the frc volume is not reached before even the frc volume is reached inspiration starts occurring so this phenomena is referred to as autopy phenomena and that will uh, give rise to uh, the continuous increase in uh, the frc to occur in patients who are suffering from emphysema so gradually their lung volume gradually starts approaching uh, the fr the tlc volume and uh, as you can see from this compliance diagram uh, you can already see that uh, compliance that is measured by c is equals to delta v by delta p the change in volume by change in pressure uh, when the volumes of the lung when the volume of the lung is already near tlc to produce a small change in volume requires a very substantial increase in pressure and this increase in pressure is manifested by increased work of breathing so the patient will require a lot of effort uh, to deeply inhale so this is sensed as dyspnea so this is the cause for dyspnea in this patient so this is the second component of uh, the dynamic airway resistance and how it applies uh, to lung uh, physiology and uh, the peak expiratory flow rate or the mean expiratory flow rate is a measurement that is obtained from spirometry which is an evaluation for the dynamic airway resistance so this completes how uh, the dynamic work of breathing is regulated so this static and dynamic components together will contribute towards the net work of breathing and net work of breathing always uh, is proportional to the requirement of the body whatever the need of the body is. suppose if you are exercising so the work of breathing must increase similarly if uh, the workload that is imposed on the uh, particular subject it is more then uh, the work of breathing will increase so this workload is basically guided by the lung the chest wall the pleura so if any of these has uh, an abnormal pathology then suppose the chest wall is very very stiff or the lung is stiff say in interstitial lung disease or the pleural cavity it is uh, having some disease because of pleural effusion then uh, in these conditions the workload of the lung will increase and in these conditions the work of breathing will increase and this increase in work of breathing uh, is sensed by the patient as dyspnea that is difficulty in respiration or shortness of breath after this uh, after discussing the first component of all respiratory process that is alveolar ventilation we have a second process uh, the second step to ventilation after alveoli have been ventilated gas exchange must occur and this gas must enter into the bloodstream and bind to hemoglobin so that uh, the uh, so that the body cells will receive oxygen and this gas exchange has two major components first is diffusion the other one is matching of this uh, perfusion to the ventilation that is uh, offered in by the alveoli so uh, this ventilation matching process is very very important uh, the diffusion can be measured clinically by dlco dlco itself has uh, important implications because dlco is uh, proportional to the vascularity into uh, the hemoglobin concentration divided by the thickness of the respiratory membrane so if i am saying that uh, the vascularity of that particular area is increasing uh, then in that condition dlco will increase if hemoglobin concentration decreases like in anemia dlco will decrease if hemoglobin concentration increases like in polycythemia then dlco will increase if i talk about the thickness of the respiratory membrane then in that condition if the thickness increases like in uh, interstitial lung disease or say for example in pulmonary edema or pneumonia the diffusion distance will increase and that will cause dlco to uh, ultimately decrease uh, ultimately decrease so these are the implications of uh, dlco and itself uh, suppose hemoglobin suppose there is uh, some uh, good pasteur syndrome and there is uh, alveolar hemorrhage in that condition also uh, you will see that the dlco will increase because there is increased uh, hemoglobin within the alveoli that can bind avidly to this uh, 
oxygen and now we have the second component that is uh, vq mismatch all ventilation uh, must be matched to perfusion or we can say that all perfusion has to be matched to ventilation so that effective oxygenation of the blood occurs so this is done by a very complex system of uh, receptors that will uh, direct the blood flow uh, the pulmonary blood flow to appropriate areas of the lung where uh, the ventilation is appropriate and uh, that will contribute to uh, arterial oxygenation you just need to know that there are two important extremes in this ventilation perfusion ratio generally in the normal run uh, in the normal run there are three zones and in the uh, in the lower zones the perfusion is maximum and so is the ventilation but the ventilation to perfusion ratio over here is actually a little less uh, in this mid zone uh, intermediate values are obtained and ventilation perfusion is adequately matched they are perfect uh, they are in perfect proportion to each other in the superior region the ventilation is less and so is the perfusion but ventilation is generally little more so v by q ratio is more than 1 the two extremes of uh, this ventilation perfusion are that v by q is equal to 0 and v by q is equals to infinity and somewhere over here is a perfect match that is v by q ratio is equals to 1 in the condition where v by q ratio is equal to 0 in the condition where v by q ratio is equal to 0 uh, we it means that ventilation was equal to 0 so perfusion was given to that particular alveoli which was not uh, which was not ventilated at all so blood that will pass through this area will not become oxygenated rather the deoxygenated blood will mix with all the oxygenated blood that is returning from other areas of the lung and that will contribute to a decrease in the arterial oxygenation uh, in the final uh, in the final arterial blood stream so this is referred to as a shunt and all shunts will lead to hypoxemia similarly when i say that v by q is equals to infinity then it means that q is equals to zero so uh, alveoli are adequately ventilated they may or may not be adequately ventilated but uh, the perfusion is completely absent so this area does not participate in the gas exchange process uh, that is central to providing oxygen to the bloodstream so respiration does not occur so this is referred to as wasted ventilation this area itself is referred to as dead space and this dead space is physiologic uh, dead space are of two types one is anatomic the other is physiologic the combination of the two is the total dead space anatomic dead space is equals to 150 ml and physiologic dead space is generally 0 ml so uh, if physiologic dead space occur it means that in some areas of the lung v by q ratio was infinity and this is pathologic so these are the few points that you should know regarding perfusion so uh, in this shunt area this what are the clinical examples that can occur uh, that will be acting as shunts so shunts can be present where there is some airway narrowing that is occurring uh, which is not very very complete of course in normal uh, normal disease also complete obstruction does not occur unless uh, rarely with the help with say for example malignancy or some foreign body obstruction but apart from this most cases will exhibit a decrease in the uh, p by q ratio less than one where the ventilation is not adequately matched to the perfusion so some partial obstruction is occurring not complete so in these conditions supplemental oxygen is beneficial in a complete shunt because there is uh, because ventilation is not occurring at all uh, you cannot expect uh, that uh, supplemental oxygen will lead to a benefit for the patient it will not improve the arterial oxygenation values now after this uh, the next discussion is uh, <coughs> the related to the area where v by q uh, ratio is infinity and this is infinity say for example in pulmonary embolism a massive pulmonary embolism it will block all blood supply and thus uh, perfusion is not occurring but ventilation keeps on occurring and thus v by q ratio is infinity this is these are the two important areas to remember after that uh, there are only few other sections uh, that are left uh, what is the formula for the oxygen that is dissolved inside the blood i have discussed about the interpretation of dlcu uh, and the alveolar gas equation and the in clinical importance of this equation has to be discussed compliance diagram i have already discussed and spirometry interpretation i will just discuss in a while so in the first portion this equation over here this is referred to as alveolar gas equation 
this alveolar gas equation basically tries to uh, evaluate the value for P alveolar O2 that is the partial pressure of oxygen that is present in the alveoli. Now uh, this value this itself is uh, represented this equation itself will tell us uh, what exactly P, how do we calculate P L O2. So in the first section uh, P L O2 is basically F I O2 times uh, the P A T M minus uh, the partial pressure of water. So we know that air that enters will enter at the uh, atmospheric pressure. Um, air is uh, humidified by passage uh, through the nasal cavity and thus water's vapor pressure is added. So because Dalton's law partial, partial pressure will state that uh, the, pa the partial pressure of gases at that same temperature and volume remain constant. If you add water then it means that uh, the other section has to fall. So uh, because of that the partial pressure of oxygen in the uh, in the uh, uh, mixture of gases itself for oxygen will fall and this has to be multiplied by the fraction of the inspired oxygen because oxygen does not constitute the entire atmospheric air. So this is the amount of gas that reaches the alveoli. It is the amount of uh, gas oxygen that will reach the alveoli. From this some part some part is consumed. Some part is consumed. So this consumption area is PaCO2 divided by uh, respiratory quotient. So we know that the respiratory quotient this is equals to volume of CO2 that is produced divided by volume of oxygen that is consumed. So some amount of oxygen that is consumed can be a part of this equation. If I reverse this VO2 is equals to VCO2 divided by RQ this is itself uh, explanatory of how we calculate PL O2. Now uh, apart from this there is one more thing that you should know P PSCO2 is inversely proportional to minute ventilation. If minute ventilation increases then PSCO2 will likely fall. So uh, this equation will also tell us the various causes of hypoxemia at the same time. So if I say that uh, uh, minute ventilation is controlling it. So if I say that for example respiratory rate is going down so minute ventilation is decreasing. So PSCO2 will increase this has a minus sign over here so PLO2 will fall. Similarly if I say that fraction of inspired oxygen is falling like for example in high altitudes again you will say that that arterial hypoxemia is going to occur in this situation. Similarly uh, if uh, we are saying that uh, there is a uh, mismatch of the uh, ventilation perfusion or shunt is occurring or impaired diffusion is occurring in any of these conditions arterial hypoxemia is occurring. So this equation is central to understanding the mechanisms of uh, hypoxemia. Now after this discussion uh, we come to the last section that is calculation of the uh, oxygen that is present inside the bloodstream. So it is given by an equation the concentration of oxygen in ml per deciliter in the bloodstream which is equals to 1.39 ml times what is the value for the hemoglobin times okay it is given in Harrison's book itself. So let me show it to you. this is the equation so concentration of oxygen that is equals to 1.39 in ml per deciliter times the hemoglobin in gram uh, into percentage oxygen saturation uh, this is the amount of oxygen that is bound to hemoglobin whereas that which is freely soluble in the bloodstream uh, that is given by SO2 okay that is equals to KH the solubility constant time P gas you can see that as measured PaO2 times the solubility constant that is 0 0.003 and this will give us the value for uh, the arterial oxygen concentration. Now the flow volume loops are also discussed in Harrison's itself and these, these are the various types of flow loop diagrams you can have a look at it um, in the textbook. So in the first diagram this is the normal uh, lung anatomy this is the normal uh, lung vo uh, flow volume loop and here uh, this is how you will read it and this is the TLC this is the residual volume this process I am sorry this process over here is the inspiratory process this is how you will read it so patient will move from res uh, the residual volume all the way up to uh, the TLC so this is the inspiratory portion of the curve this is the expiratory portion of the curve. Uh, this under normal conditions under maximal expiration uh, initially there is a maximal flow that will be achieved but after that dynamic air flow limitation will cause the, the peak expiratory flow rate to fall at every uh, specific lung volume. Now if I say that there is uh, some airway obstruction occurring uh, 
the airway obstruction that is occurring that is uh, then represented by the scalloping of this expiratory portion of the curve and a fall in the maximal uh, expiratory flow rate that is that can be achieved now if i say that the there is a fixed type of obstruction be it intrathoracic or extrathoracic then uh, there is a plateauing that is uh, of the curves of both the inspiration as well as the expiratory component whereas if there is a variable type of obstruction at the level of the intrathoracic or the extrathoracic area you will see that when the particular limitation is intrathoracic okay when the particular limitation is uh, intrathoracic then uh, the obstruction that will occur then the obstruction that will occur will affect the expiratory loop it will affect the expiratory loop whereas when the uh, obstruction is uh, uh, likely extrathoracic then it will affect the inspiratory loop this is uh, the evaluation for the flow volume loops i think that completes the discussion of uh, our discussion related to this particular topic i hope you will read this topic from uh, the book itself uh, if you have any questions then you can ask uh, on live chat or uh, you can post it in the comments i will be uh, very happy to answer them